Ah, well, God bless you. Heaven smile on you. It's good to be back with you and this time with a superb guest all the way from the Republic of South Sudan, a relatively new country uh, in the global neighborhood. And in the person of Francis Bach, uh, good to have you here with us today. Thank you. Thank you. Bishop. Yes, sir. Yeah, we've been having a good time. Indeed, we have. Uh, hearing your testimony and hearing what God's doing in different parts of the world. So, um, your book, which uh, I should <clears throat> have a copy of, it'll be up on the screen, uh, Escape from Slavery. And uh, we need to take a couple of moments and give a little overview of your experience in life and how you got from Sudan at the time, now as the Republic of South Sudan, now how you got from Sudan to America and what's going on how should we uh, chime in on what's going on with you? Well, thank you. The thing is, uh, <clears throat> it's, a, it's such an honor to be on uh, television and to be watched all over the world and to speak here on my own behalf and on behalf of my new country that I'm very proud of, the Republic of South Sudan, which is 11 years old, the world member of number 193rd in the world, in the United Nations, and number, uh, number 54th in the continent of Africa. Um, it, it really goes back to <coughs> years of struggle. Mm. Well, my people, a year of liberation, a year of searching for peace and stability. Our country is Sudan, which now we ceded from to become South Sudan as a country of its own, was colonized by British. Um, but when British left, that country in 1956, the people of my region then, South Sudanese, and the people of Darfur, which is in Western Sudan, and the people of Nuba Mountains in Southern Cote d'Ivoire, and the people of Blue Nile, and far north, Aswan, and the people of Bija in Eastern Sudan had fall exactly under the colonizations of British against elite Arab groups who had come to that country and continue with suppressing and oppressing and marginalizing my people. And South Sudan since then, even though the whole country gained it independent from British, we never felt that independence, particularly the black people, were being marginalized. The majority were led by South Sudanese, where I hailed from. We had never felt the sense of independence, sense of respect, equalization and everything. Politically, economically, and socially, we have never been equal and treated equally as the same citizens. My people have always been labeled as a third-class citizen in their own country. And with that, my people pick up the arms, the people of South Sudan, and we've been battling and fighting over the years. Mm. We fought the first war. From 55 to 1972, we signed a peace with the elite government in Khartoum. But that peace did not last. It broke out again, and we fought from 1983 until 2005. When we from have what? 1983 83? until 2005, in January 2005, then we signed the peace. The peace that we signed was not just a gift. Khartoum regime did not just decide it to say, let the people of South Sudan decide the fate. 
but it took us sacrifices of over two million lives. Mm. Men and women were perished in that war. That include my own parents, both my father and my mother, and twin uncles, and many people that I'm related or neighboring have died during that war. So in 2005, when the whole world heard of us, our story, and stood behind us, and particularly the United States of America, and this is where I came in personally and my people to acknowledge and to appreciate the previous administration of the United States of America under the Purdue leadership of former President George W. Bush. He's indeed our hero. He came in, he broke the silence. When the whole world turned their back on us in deaf years, and he stood up. Mm. He promised that before he left the office, that the U.S. president would make sure the peace comes and become a reality in the country of Sudan. Indeed, he did it. He, stand, he sent a strong man, a great leader, Colin Powell, to mediate, and he was among those who have sat on the table in negotiation with the Khartoum government, the most strictest government, most strictest group to negotiate with. They are taught on everything until the peace become a reality and the interim period of six years were given for the people of South Sudan and almost was supposed to be the same thing for the people of Lunai and Abyei, which is the region that is oil rich belong to the south mm. to decide in six years whether they will vote for the United Sudan to keep Sudan as a one country or choose to vote for their own states but we have did it beautifully in 2011 on July 9 2011 we have all voted for independence of South Sudan during that referendum. I'm a U.S. citizen, a dual citizen of the United States, and I voted in America for separation from the whole country because that country never represented me as equal citizens. That country never recognizes or never even allowed my region to develop. There's no roads in South Sudan. There's no hospital in South Sudan. There's no clean water in South Sudan. When in fact, South Sudan region, the most richest land, mm. agricultural land, and we have other minerals, other natural resources that are available there that motivate us, these Arabs from the north to come and occupy our areas which they still do, even as of today. So, as South Sudan become a country now, and those of us were lucky, as I could just flash back about the history of the country, most of us were born in the war. I was born in the year of 1979. And during the short period I lived with my parents, which I have never seen and will never see again until age of seven in 1986. I was seven years old. I became a victim of that war I just described that ended in 2005. What, what, what was the actual capsule experience? For well, that happened, you know, I was uh, sent to the local market by my mother one of the evening in the year 1986. Parents had choice sometimes to ask among their children who to ask to do what. And I think it was God touched my mom's heart that day to ask me to go to the local market to sell eggs and peanuts. I believe that's the reason I'm surviving. He didn't manage it. 
for anything evil, even though evil things happen for both of us. Yeah. I had left the local mar market to sell eggs and peanuts with the joy and happiness and someone would do a favor for the parents and particularly to my mom. But I had never made it back from that marketplace. My village was raided behind me by the groups of Arabs that called themselves Arab Bagar or Arab Murahaleen. Now they are so known with the issue of Darfur, Arab um, Jinjawit people who always on horseback get the weapons from Khartoum government, the elite government that leading that country under the dictator president Omar Asan Ahmed al-Bashir who came to that power by military coup since 1989 to present. In fact, he's the most wanted man. He has committed the crimes against his humanity slavery in Darfur, in South Sudan, and all over across the country of Sudan. Still in and he has now. been indicted by the International Criminal Court, ICC, along with his uh, light, those who were supporting him. So I became a victim of slavery where I served 10 years in captivity. When my village raided, the same group that raided my village came to the marketplace and raid the same market and captured women and children. And I was actually taken to slavery at the age of seven, spending 10 years in captivity as a property of another man. And after multiple attempts, I was able to succeed and made my way to the capital of Sudan, Khartoum. Mm -hmm. And eventually, with the help of some tribe men, in Khartoum, where I stayed in one of the refugee camps called Jabarona, I was able to make my way to Egypt by land, taking a boat from Egypt, from Sudan border through Egypt. And I spent a good two years in Egypt searching for refugee status until I was given the result of men to come to America in late of 1999 as a refugee. But one thing I have not forgotten uh, when I came here is that I knew very well how my people are still in that region, in that country. I did not just came and enjoy my immigration life as immigrant, like any other immigrants that came from all over the world to seek for the betterment of their lives in the communities. I have decided to dedicate my life story to speak out on the plight of my people because I said, what is good my freedom? Although I'm in the greatest nation, the United States of America, what is good my freedom if my people are still dying? What is good my freedom if my people are still in slavery? So I said to myself, I will do whatever it takes in my part as individual or as a victim to speak out, to spread awareness, to read reminded American people and the world that slavery is not history. Mm. Although people think that slavery ended, particularly with the history of the U.S. after the civil rights movement, that slavery ended over 200 years ago. 1865, people need to think again. Hmm. We have about less than a minute left in this segment, and uh, we'll do another. Um, where, in the next segment, I, I want us to address how and who in America <clears throat> are, would be in the best position to assist what need to happen or what may be happening already in the Republic of South Sudan. We want to address that. Who it is and how they can best help and assist in South Sudan through what's going on in your life. Well, friends, you're listening to a, a, a powerful uh, testimony. And no doubt some 
have been keeping up in the news, mm -hmm. Defar and other uh, uh, places that we've heard in the news and was kind of foggy about, hey, what, what's it all about? Well, we have someone here today that really helped us out in that particular uh, understanding. So, um, appreciate you. And uh, we'll be back and stay tuned. God bless. Mm -hmm.